This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, doctor burnout during the pandemic. When I go into a room to see a patient, I don't want to stay there any longer than I need to because the longer I'm there, the more likely I am to get infected. Educating doctors to be both resilient and empathetic when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics, from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. Many people started realizing that there were also families and children experiencing homelessness. The homeless epidemic in the U.S. Then... We made commitments to be on call 24 hours a day. We worked 18, 20 hour days, seven days a week, no vacations. The all-consuming world of cults. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Posted in front of many hospitals and other health care facilities around the country, you see signs saying heroes work here. And it's true. Many doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals have been saving lives, working long hours at great personal risk the last several months. We expect that of them. It's part of their training. One thing physicians are very good at is putting one foot in front of the other. Medical training does make you resilient. You know, you have those years of residency when you're not sleeping, you're working day and night, and you do learn, and even before that, during your medical training, you learn to just set your needs aside and to just keep on trucking. And I think that characteristic does, in one respect, play a crucial role now. So physicians will continue to show up for work. They'll continue to take care of patients, and they'll continue to wear very uncomfortable, suffocating clothing, and they'll do it. But for Dr. Saul Weiner, that means medical care won't be as good as it might otherwise be without all the stress. Weiner is professor of medicine, pediatrics, and medical education at the University of Illinois at Chicago, director of the Center of Innovation for Complex Chronic Health Care at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and author of the new book on becoming a healer, the journey from patient care to caring about your patients. I can just say personally that when I go into a room to see a patient and I'm wearing, you know, like face mask and gloves and a gown and so forth, I don't want to stay there any longer than I need to because the longer I'm there, the more likely I am to get infected. And that is a huge problem if you're trying to have a relaxed, meaningful conversation with a patient. So I do think that the current environment, just because it poses a direct threat to the physician, makes it even more difficult to engage. However, Weiner says engaging with patients even before the pandemic was difficult. And that's one reason so many doctors are burned out. If you can't connect with patients, it makes for an unfulfilling job. And there are lots of reasons the connection's missing today. The ones that everybody talks about are external to the physician. They have to do with all the hassle that goes into the medical record and all the documentation that you have to do when you're with a patient and the hassle with insurance companies and the sense of loss of autonomy. Physicians now are most often employees of large corporations. And so there's a lot of sentiment that that's frustrating and demoralizing and is leading to burnout among physicians, which is a huge problem. I mean, about 50% of physicians do report that they are burned out. And burnout is really just another word for depression. It's very significant. And so those are the common reasons that are given. I think they're all valid to a degree. I do think that the medical record is a big problem. I'm a primary care doctor myself, and I find, you know, I sometimes almost half-jokingly talk about the fact that it becomes the doctor-computer relationship, and the patient is almost like a third party, a data source. You know, that's very demoralizing. Weiner says medical school is an enormous factor in the disconnect between doctors and patients. In fact, he says it starts even before that, with the courses undergraduates are expected to take to get into medical school in the first place. The whole pre-medical thing is a big problem. There's just kind of like a hazing. The big one, of course, is organic chemistry, which everybody has to take. And many, many people who think they want to be doctors drop out. And it's kind of a hazing. I say that because nobody remembers any organic chemistry and nobody uses it once they become a doctor. So the question, of course, is why do they make everybody jump through that hoop? And the answer is, I don't know. 
And then after they've recruited students who are good in science, medical school itself grinds prospective doctors down. The training that we go through is very long and very involved. There's some great things about it in terms of providing technical preparation, but a lot of the culture of medicine and the way physicians are trained, I think, turns them into what I call task completers, people who are very good at getting tasks done, but who are diminished in terms of growing as individuals who are comfortable fully and openly engaging with people in their lives, and especially patients. And so if that's how you turn out, then you know, imagine if you're in, in practice all day and you're just seeing one patient after another, and instead of it being a fulfilling human interaction, it's just like you know checking boxes off and asking routine questions and then you know writing notes. And I think that type of interaction is it's not nourishing for physicians, and of course it's not good for patients either. Medical schools claim that they teach the emotional side of caring for patients, but Weiner says they don't really do the job. Every medical school talks about the importance of teaching bedside manner. And there's always a course in the first and usually the second year of medical school that has a component of uh, that in it. But my experience, both from having been a student myself and also a teacher in medical schools for many, many years and, and then out as an observer, is that they fall far short of what people need, that they're very kind of didactic. In fact, the whole notion of bedside manner to me is a problem because a manner is it's just the word manner. It just implies that it's almost scripted, right? It's almost a little fake style. What I'm talking about is different. I'm talking about simply having a sense of shared humanity with the patients and understanding that you're all passing through life together and that this is fundamentally just one person trying to be helpful to another. And in many ways, that's sort of the opposite of holding people at arm's length and wearing a white coat and just being in that kind of scripted persona type role which is what I think happens to so many physicians. That kind of fake humanity is especially harmful when an interaction can't afford to be impersonal, when it needs to feel safe. The stakes go up in medical interactions. One thing I talked about is that there's a lot of emotion. So patients are often frightened, they're anxious, they're concerned, they may be getting bad news. And the physician has to be a safe person to have those types of emotions around. So, for example, if the patient gets angry, and the physician becomes defensive, that's a big problem. If you get defensive, then that's a lack of balance of clarity. You're kind of confusing the situation with your own kind of insecurities. And I think that one of the critical dynamics that occurs in medical training is that physicians sort of become increasingly insecure over the course of their training because it is such a battering process. And they start to hold patients at a distance because they don't have a clear sense of personal boundaries. They don't really know how to stay fully present when a patient cries or gets angry. And so they sort of get into this persona where they just hold patients at a kind of casual arm's length. It's obviously important for doctors to be taught to be resilient and technically competent. But if they've also learned to put up a wall between themselves and patients, it's a recipe for poor patient care and doctor burnout. Mending the problem begins where doctors begin, in medical school. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. Radio Health Journal returns in just a moment. A new survey from the National Blood Clot Alliance shows more than 70% of U.S. adults on blood thinners are more cautious about routine activities, and 42% say the risk of major bleeding has discouraged them from trying new ones. The findings also show more than half of those taking blood thinners fear a life-threatening bleed, and nearly three-quarters of that group say it's impacted their quality of life. That's unfortunate, says Michael B. Strife, MD, FACP, Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. Blood thinners save lives, but many people taking them are avoiding activities they love, like gardening or exercising, because they're afraid of experiencing serious or dangerous bleeding. That's why talking to your doctor is important to understand how to reduce the risk and learn how bleeding, if it does occur, can be treated. The good news is that 95% of people taking blood thinners have talked with their doctor about such risks. Visit StopTheClot.org slash guide for more. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of MediaTracks Communications. 
Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. To be questioned, to be villainized, that's what a majority of them is not what they signed up for. Why so many local public health officials are quitting in the middle of a pandemic. Then the under-recognition of PTSD, not in soldiers or first responders, but in children. Unfortunately, that by the age of 16, two-thirds of all youth in the United States have probably been exposed to some kind of life-threatening traumatic event. All that and more on Radio Health Journal. 